state of the human condition. What I would uh, refer to as ill overall. Ill in the sense that a pandemic has arrived and decimated a significant portion of humanity and continues to threaten your existence every day. Hey, don't look at me for answers. I'm already dead. You're killing me. You're killing me. So, Boney has invited his close friend to maybe help you understand your way a little better. He's a very special guest, and sometimes referred to as the Angel of Death himself. Mr. Griefwalker, Stephen Jenkinson, thank you for joining us on the show. You're very welcome. Stephen is a worker, author, storyteller, culture activist and founder of Orphan Wisdom. It's a teaching house for skills of deep living and making human culture that are mandatory in endangered and endangering times. It's a redemptive project and it comes from where we come from. It's rooted in knowing your history and being claimed by your ancestors. Working for a time that we won't see. And I think that's a really, really great note. Not just a line, but a call to action. To work for generations beyond our own. It's a challenge enough for many to provide for themselves, their families and children, to then also think of future generations. Those you cannot see, speak with, or be in presence now. This is especially difficult work. But let's, let's put it this way, very, very simply. If everybody was doing their best, a very common line, if everybody was doing their best, we wouldn't be in the state we're in, man. Not at any level. So the only conclusion that's available is we're not doing our best. What does it take to get there? Well, leisure time's not getting it done, not in the West. So the more leisure time, the busier we get. So what's left? Um, some people, I guess, uh, different, different ways of doing so, I, myself included, self-designate to occupy a kind of soothsaying function. Soothsaying has nothing to do with predicting the future, by the way. As you said about the coming generation, the coming generation is not uh, in the future. Right. I mean, eventually they will, you know, incarnate mm. and, and take up room uh, and make their mistakes and drive around and run into things and so on. That's in the future. But us knowing about them coming on is in the present. And our obligation is to is to respond to that reality in how we behave in the present. So there's no conjecture about the matter, right? We are somebody else's future, are we not? We are. Um, you know, there was a time we weren't dreamed of, and now we're doing the dreaming, apparently. So, so at least on a good day there were a clutch of people who were behaving and conducting themselves as if we'd be. It seems to me during the course of my lifetime, fewer and fewer people have been willing to self-regulate with a view to the generations to come, to take less, to have less. So it brings me to a, a memory of a time I was sitting on a dock on the Pacific Ocean talking with a man in his late 30s, early 40s, he had a couple of young kids. And uh, he was lamenting about 
the difficulty that so many men have in finding honorable work that doesn't harm the planet directly or otherwise that they can be proud of and um, and so forth and understandably so this is a legitimate dilemma and uh, somewhere in there he was articulating the feeling without saying so that um, that he, he felt alone in this undertaking and it fell to me to say as follows you know one of the dilemmas you're describing is how you can provide the material upside that you feel you have an obligation to your kids to provide but i would say to you your obligation is otherwise and you haven't even suggested it yet and this is what it is your kids deserve less than you had when you were their age your kids deserve less right than you had at their age at you, you what you had at their age exactly in other words what i mean is well we've had you know a couple of generations um, dominated by the view that kids deserve more than we had when we were kids that was that's uh -huh. true for people who grew up during right. the depression certainly felt uh -huh. that way who grew up during the second war felt that way who grew up in the booming 50s felt that way and try to proceed accordingly and we have the world that we have partly as a direct consequence of this mad insistence that our kids deserve more we received the more did we not my generation did and look at how we proceeded and look at the outcome so at the very least we could consider the possibility that getting that providing everything you think you kids deserve has a downside you never counted on that and the downside point, is yeah. the regime that the that the plague that the pandemic failed to seriously challenge so stephen this brings me to the question of the work with children as a skeleton puppet form representation of death I th i'm often received uh, by children with mixed feelings as well as with all however it does present a unique question of how best to speak to children or with children on the topic of or about death what are your thoughts and how have you spoken with children on that topic yeah it's a great question um the first thing we should do is make some distinctions that let's say over a 10-year period from the age of four to the age of 14 there's a lot of changes and even though you could refer to all of those people in that in that span as young or kids you'd obviously treat them very differently from one year of age to the next so we don't want want to generalize too much across any kind of age spectrum but i would say this we tend to shortchange our kids in terms of granting them the capacity to understand uh, complex things they understand according to their their need to understand uh which is different from our standard of understanding they have a functional understanding, you see? And one of the reasons that dying kids were so often underserved by the palliative care industry is because of the conviction that kids couldn't understand the idea of finality or ever and ever amen. And so they weren't they weren't told that they were dying, for example. Uh, in, and the language of sickness prevailed in Sid. And I don't know that that practice has been seriously challenged even up to this present moment. Uh, maybe hypothetically, but in practice at the bedside, um, I don't know. So I would just say by that standard, adults shouldn't be told that they're dying either because they have not manifested an ability to live in the presence of finality either and to translate it into some kind of, you know, world sustaining behavior. But um, the other thing, well, I'll t tell two little stories. Uh, maybe this will take up too much time, but Oh, well, that's what we have for the moment. The first story is um, 
I would be asked routinely when I was working in the death trade um, whether or not so and so should bring their kids to either the the deathbed of, of let's say their grandparents or the funeral home or the gravesite. And my my response was always the same. I would say, why wouldn't you? So in other words, I'm changing the emphasis of the question and putting the onus upon the person who's who's doubting the the necessity or the mandate of doing so uh, to wonder about their that sense of necessity. So typically the response would be, uh, well, I, you know, I don't want to terrorize or traumatize my kids. Right. I said, of course not. Why would they be traumatized? Well, you know, uh, grandma doesn't uh, doesn't look too good. I said, well, that's true. She doesn't look too good. But that's not the same thing as trauma. Well, and this was the, always the punchline. Well, I'd like I'd like my kids to remember their grandmother the way she was. I see. So in other words, the only way to save your kids from certain sorrow is to police the kind of memories they're allowed to have of their grandparents. And so what you're what you're willing is that <clears throat> remember the, the grandparents playing with them. And that's the last memory. So the the, the moral of that story we had a little technical glitch there, but just to summarize it, the moral of the story is that um, kids, you know, are are capable of nursing a memory that's not pleasant. But when they're warned away from unpleasant memories or they're banished or disallowed entirely, be not surprised that when they turn into grown-ups, quote unquote, at least chronologically grown-ups, uh, they continue that bad habit of staying away from the stuff that doesn't please them too much and dying is an early casualty. Uh, the understanding of dying is an early casualty of that kind of prejudice. The other story I wanted to tell you uh, is uh, very, to me, very compelling and uplifting and soothsaying as well. So I am go see a family of a seven-year-old who's dying of leukemia. She's down the hall in her hospital room. The family's in the family room. I'm sitting with the family and they're, you know, they're going crazy in their way, as you'd expect. And, um, you know, one of the things I, I try to plumb the depths of early when I'm in that situation is um, what is it that grieves them most? Now, if you ask them directly, you don't get a very good answer, but you can you can insinuate their take on things from what they say. And generally speaking, they believe that the source of their real heartache is the fact that their child is dying. But if you push it further, you can hear that there's something else. And this may be very dismaying. I don't know, but I have no reason to lie to you. Um, what the real issue is for the many of the parents of kids who are dying is that the child is being betrayed fundamentally by life in the form of not getting to live a full life or some version of that phrase, but it's there and it's there in spades. And so I would say, um, have you asked your daughter whether this is true about her full life status? And they said, of course not. You know, it's, it would be a terrible thing to rub her face in it, so to speak. I said, do you mind if I go and ask her now and I'll just come back and tell you what she says? And they're curious to hear what the answer is. So I would go and I would sit beside this young girl. And I did. I said, you know, I was just down in the family room with your parents. Yeah. And, uh, well, a lot of craziness there. Yeah, she said. I said, do you know why? And the, the daughter would say, well, yeah, I, I can see it hurts the most when they know that I know that I'm dying. So when they're around, I just don't know which is heartbreaking in itself. I said, yeah, I think you got it figured out pretty good. But there's another thing that came up today. They're really heartbroken about the fact that you won't get to live a full life. And the seven-year-old looks at me with genuine perplexity, as if she has no idea what that means, never mind how anybody could be upset by it. So I actually have to explain to her what how it's possible not to have a full life 
because you got to remember at seven years old it's the only kind of life that is available to you you have to learn how to feel ripped off by your allotment but at seven years old you have no capacity to see it that way so i would say to her well look i know it's a strange idea but i need a few examples from you that i can bring back to your family and and see if i can help them a few examples of a full life and she basically submits to the idea because you know adults are obviously weird and this is another example so she said well i mean this is true this this happened she said well i had a i rode a horse one time that was it that was that was her example and it was pretty faithful she caught the spirit of it very well i said okay that's good but really you got to give me three because one is just not enough to convince anybody in their heartbreak. She said, okay. She said, uh, I fell off, which it, that's a full life between those two events and everything in between. That's a full life, you know, completely qualifies. But I said, just one more, humor me, just one more. And she told this story about how she was kind of fond of the neighbor boy, but she was felt shy and she didn't know how to be with him and and uh one time they were together in the backyard playing and some fly landed on his cheek and she didn't want the fly on his cheek so she leaned over to to brush the fly away and uh and touched his cheek by accident that was the third one i said i said to her i think i i got that's plenty and i went back to the family room and I don't even know if I got to the third one. Everybody's in tears, you see. And they're in tears. Why? Well, because they think she doesn't understand how sick she is. And, sad, and that's sad because they could have understood that she did know. She did know how sick she was. But she couldn't participate with them in the idea that death rips off life. She just couldn't see it that way. Because she wasn't old enough. She had to get to puberty to feel ripped off and... She's never going to learn that lesson, which is something to be grateful for. So those are the kind of things that I think we should honor kids with, with it, not necessarily talking about dying. I mean, that's the easiest thing to do. The much more challenging thing is to talk about a number of things as if dying is present in the things you're talking about without it being the singular subject to talk about. You talk as if dying is there rather than about dying and you cover a lot more ground and you can get heard a lot better too. You're killing me. You're killing me. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Steven, it's a, a true honor uh, to be in your presence virtually and otherwise. And Thank you, boss. And our work. I, I can tell you have something you'd like to say. Yeah, I have a question for you. Maybe we can sign off with this one and I get a chance to listen here. Mm -hmm. And it's this. You know, the living, you're familiar with us and uh -huh. our crazy ways. The living um, seem oh, yeah. to need oh, yeah. a drink of some fairly stiff brew to be begin to even approach dying at death and all the realities uh -huh. therein or to approach their dead kin their ancestors mm. and so on they need uh -huh. they need a certain kind of inebriating lubrication to just loosen the reins a little bit on being alive so i'm wondering when you're obliged to mingle with the living as you are from time to time do you need a stiff drink yourself to be able to bear down and bear the burden of oh, being yeah, around us. Oh, yeah, you're speaking my language, Stephen. A little liquid goes a long way. Lubricating these dry bones of mine. <laughs> <laughs> I'd gladly raise a toast to life, death, and everything in between. Our work is more overlapping than is separate, so... Uh, from this side of the the great mortal divide to your side, uh, salute.
Salud. Salud. Cheers. Cheers. All right. Go, 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 go. Product placement, baby. Cheers to Mr. Jenkinson. Thank you to Orphan Wisdom. We hope you've learned something about something. One of you boneheads got to get something out of this anyway, right? Hey, if you did, DM me at OG Pony Tony. And remember, you're better off dead. Ha ha ha. All right, bonehead, get out of here. You're killing me. You're killing me. Ha <laughs> I gotta go to 